Emmy from Adventurebox here and I'm back with another tutorial. Right, we've gone over how to create game worlds, except for Minecraft import. I know I said it was next, but I promise it's on its way. And here is a world. But all we have now is just a bunch of blocks. How can we make it a bit more, well, like a game? Well, a good place to start would be to figure out how to edit a world. Which brings us to today's topic, a basic overview of our maker. Behold! The humble adventure box flatland. Yay! Pretty empty, right? Well, the fact that I picked up flatland adds to that, I suppose. Terrain would at least give us some hills and trees or something. But isn't that also exciting in a way? A world being empty just means that I can fill it with anything. Okay, we should probably start by going over the controls. For the sake of keeping focus, I want to start with the keyboard controls. Actually, there's quite a lot to cover here, so I'll try to be quick. Keyword here is try. I'll put a timestamp to the editing options if this takes a bit too long for you. Use W, A, S, D to move the camera. You can also use G and B to go up and down. Y toggles the visibility of the UI. Or lets you switch between maker mode and player mode, the latter which lets you do a quick playtest of your world. Very useful for parkour levels, since you can measure for yourself the distance to a jump. P, or this camera icon down here, takes a screenshot. This is nice for thumbnails. Just pick the best angle of your world and... Say cheese! H lets you rotate any item or creature that you're holding. V toggles the quest view. In this mode, the blocks turn transparent, leaving only items, creatures, and event triggers and quests visible. N toggles the brightness. If you're, for example, building a cave, this would be useful if you're having trouble seeing in the dark. Shift does several things, actually. For one thing, it speeds up your camera movement, but it also lets you place out duplicates of items and creatures, as well as override a type of block. Control and Z lets you undo an action. Escape, or this list button down here, opens this menu. This also goes for when you're playing an adventure box game, by the way. On this screen, you can change your game's title, add a game description, and change the thumbnail. Oh, while we're on this menu, let's talk about these headings here. Just like the thumbnail menu I talked about in making a game world, game page will take you to a game's game page and let you do a full playtest of your game. Options takes you to the Options menu. Duh. Here, you can change your keyboard controls by highlighting these boxes and pressing your preferred key instead. You can also adjust your mouse sensitivity, draw distance, resolution, and field of view. As well as turn on and off fancy effects and client-side storage. You can also check your performance here. Huh? What's performance, you say? Well, I think I'll save that for another video. It's uh, a bit of a mouthful. Let's move on to the mouse controls. Hold down the right mouse button to rotate the camera. Be careful when you do this, it's easy to get dizzy if it's too fast. Right-clicking anything will bring up a circular menu. The contents of the menu will depend on what you click. If you right-click the sky, for example, you can adjust the time of day, weather, and lighting effects. I'll go over the other circular menu options later. I know, I know, I'm skipping a lot of stuff, but we'll be here forever if I explain everything in detail and I'm trying to keep a good pace here. Right clicking when holding anything will reset your cursor. The left mouse button does a lot of things too. It can place out things, move placed out things if you click and drag, and delete blocks. Okay, I think that just about does it for the controls. Now, let's talk about the palette. Oh, what's that you say? Well, you see this menu over to the left? This is the palette. It contains everything you need to add and modify stuff here. There's been a reason I've called the world's empty canvases. The palette here is what you'll color your world with. By the way, right-clicking a block will also bring up the palette options in the circular menu. Let's start with the blocks. Well, the blocks. Of course. Well, building blocks to be exact. 
You can use these different materials to build pretty much anything. For instance, do you want to build a tree? You can. Make a hut or a mountain. Do you want to create a lake with water? Or lava? Or both? This goes for all the palettes, by the way. To choose anything to place out in the world, just click on it, like so. Now you can place it out. When it comes to blocks specifically, however, click and drag to place out or delete many blocks at once. You'll get a warning if you place out or delete a very large amount of them, but don't worry about it. This is just to ensure that a chunk of your world isn't deleted by accident. Oh, and the dripper tool up here can copy any blocks in your world. Perfect for when you see a type of block in the world and don't want to look for the same type in the palette. Hmm? What's this down here? This is a quick select menu. If you placed out anything, right click to remove it from your cursor and realize that you want to place out more of it, you can just click down here to equip it again. Five different quick select options will be here at a time. And they will be replaced when you keep selecting materials for your world. Just keep that in mind. Let's move on to structures. These are houses, trees, hills, etc. They're pre-made buildings made of blocks, so these are perfect if you don't want to build your own buildings. And since they're made of blocks, if you want to modify them, go right ahead. I personally prefer red houses myself, though that may be because I'm Swedish. Red houses are a staple here for some reason. Down here are items. There are buttons to press, cakes to eat and doors to open, oh my! And they're not just for decoration. They can also be affected by event triggers and be part of quests. And what are those? I'll tell you in another video. Be a bit careful with these though. Items aren't loaded into the world in the same way that blocks are, so too many items in a world will affect the performance. Right clicking them will, aside from turning them into quests and event triggers, also give you the option to rename them, turn them invisible, rotate them, or delete them. Next we have creatures. These are your world's NPCs. You can give them dialogue, change the behavior, have them be parts of quests, or just have them fill up your world. Right clicking on them will have most of the same options as items, and some unique ones, like giving them dialogue, managing their inventory, or changing the behavior. I'll also save how to create creatures for a different video, since it takes a little while to go over everything. Maybe I should have made a bingo card for you guys to fill every time I decide to skip over stuff. Down here are sounds. This will let you add some audio to your world. There are three categories for sounds. Sound effects are, well, sound effects. You can find things like birds, alarm noises, and even the Wilhelm scream. Incredible! The scream has been around since the 50s and it's still funny to me. Though did you know the name for the scream isn't actually the origin of the scream itself? There's your useless trivia for the day. Atmospheres is more akin to background noise, I suppose. There's forest sounds, crowds, etc. Finally, there's music. It's just what it sounds like. Huh? Huh? Get it? Boom. You suck! I'll see myself out. <coughs> Alright. When you place out these sounds in your world, remember that the sound is the strongest in the spot where you've placed it out. So the inverse is true as well. The further away a player gets from it, the weaker the sound will be. The circular menu for sounds will let you toggle whether the sound should loop or not, turn on and off auto playing sounds, and adjust the volume of the sound. So you could either have a guy screaming non-stop, or just once and then never again. Now, here we're reaching a category that is different depending on whether you're making an open world or battlefield game. For open world, there are shops. The contents of the shops depend on the type of shop and who sells them. There are human shops, goblin shops, and dwarf shops. Actually, having shops is not just nice for whoever plays your game, but for you as well. See, when your shop sells anything, you get a cut of the money as well. It's like you're the landlord. For Battlefield, however, there is no shop category. Buying clothes while you're having laser bullets flying your way doesn't sound very fun. Or you just have some skewed priorities if that sounds good to you. No offense though. Instead, there are pickups. I guess the placement of it is a little bit different as well. Here, you can find various types of guns and power-ups that you can place out in your multiplayer maps. Now this one is an interesting category. Here there be portals. There are a few nice designs to choose from, from the simple to the extravagant. 
but the fun part comes when you place it out. See, one adventure box feature is that you can use portals to connect your world to any other world. And I do mean any other. Just type the name of the world you wish to connect to, and click the thumbnail. Boom! Linked! You can place out up to five portals with a connection in a world. And if you don't want to connect to a world, you don't have to. Just leave the portal as it is, if you just wanted this decoration. They are very nice looking. Like this one, doesn't this look like a runestone to you? This appeals to my viking ancestry. Oh, a right clicking will let you create a connection if there isn't one, or jump through a portal to the connected world. Beneath it is the quest palette. Here you can look at all of the quests and event triggers that you've created. Like I said, I'll go over what those are in another video. Lastly, there's locations. Use these location flags to mark places of interest in your world. A user that has played your world before will also be able to spawn at one of these flags from the start. Just click create a new location flag, place it out, and name your location. Clicking on any of the flags you placed out here will take you right to them. This way, if you want to edit a certain part of the world and you've forgotten where it was, you can go to it directly. The days of searching are over. Right clicking them brings up the same options as items, by the way. Right. That's that. So let's say that you've filled your world with stuff and you think it's ready to share. Then it's time to publish your game. Publishing is easy. You can do it either by pressing this button here, or going to the pause menu and clicking this line up here. Just click to confirm that you want to do it. And it's done! You'll get an HTML version of the link as well, that you can put on blogs and such to embed the game on the site. And if you want to unpublish the world again, just open the pause menu and click the line again. Oh, and one last tip. Make sure to give your game an interesting title and cool thumbnail to get lots of players to notice it and play it. And spread the word to your friends and family as well. And that just about covers the basics for how the maker works. For further questions, please leave a comment on this video, send us an email or join our Discord server. The link is in the description below. Thank you for watching and I'll see you next time.